five straight wins for the UConn men's basketball team. They're sitting at 15 and four as Charlotte Carroll of the Athletic joins us on this episode of Run It Back. I'm Noam Watt. My co-host is Jacob Sondick and the 28th ranked UConn men's basketball team. Now six and two in the Big East after taking care of business in Chicago on Saturday night, winning a tough game, pretty close margin over DePaul, 57 to 50. So Charlotte, what helped UConn come out on top in kind of an interesting environment? Wasn't quite hostile, wasn't quite empty. Um, but what helped them come out on top that allowed them to keep the momentum rolling as the calendar turns from January to February? Definitely. The DePaul win was courtesy of RJ Cole. I mean, obviously everyone, uh, Adama Sinogo came out in the second half and, and really had a dominant performance, but RJ Cole carried the Huskies through that first half when a lot of them were struggling offensively. So it's interesting to kind of see him. We've known him, that elder statesman, that presence that he's had for this team. But when he's in the game, it's really evident the role that he can play and he just always seems to find the bucket and, and just kind of help them along and they really need it. It was the RJ Cole show, 25 points, uh, nine of 17 from the field. He really played beautifully in the first half as well when nothing was going right for UConn. He had more than half their points in that first half. Mm-hmm. So no go was kind of non-existent for the first half. It looked like he was just out of place. His shots weren't falling. He was getting touches way too far away from the rim. But then he had that long touchdown pass from Andre Jackson to end the first half and then finish with a near double-double, 10 points, eight rebounds. Um, Andre Jackson played really strong again, 13 boards. Just really looked like he was in control of his game. He had one turnover on the fast break that looked like Andre of a couple of months ago. But other than that, it's that high level of performance we've seen. 13 turnovers for UConn, not great. And their shooting from beyond the arc was paltry. Two of 15 from there, just 13%. But a win's a win, a road win is a win. And I think Sonic wants to ask you where, where you might see UConn in the poll. Yeah, so the rankings are always fluid. It's tough to really gauge like how much they mean. But because UConn didn't lose, they're guaranteed a spot in the top 25. So with all, all the stuff going on around them, where do you think they fall in this week's rankings? It's supposed to drop in a couple hours, as they do every Monday. So what are your thoughts on that? I think probably um, just in terms of the teams that they beat this week and, and just kind of them almost, I mean, they carried, they got it out, they got it out versus DePaul, but then they also played the bottom of the big, big East. So I'm not sure if they make a huge jump to like top 15, they're at number 20 right now. So I think they could probably maybe go 19 or 18 this week. And if they keep this up, they play Creighton on Tuesday then they move into this really difficult stretch in February where it's going to be a huge test for this team. So depending upon what happens this week, I think is going to be even more interesting, but they really, um, they pulled out what they needed to. And I think a big thing for this team is they didn't let up versus the bottom teams. And again, this is a biggie. So it's so competitive. You, you're seeing all these crazy matchups these late game wins. Um, but it's really important for UConn and Dan Hurley is stressed, like not letting up in these, these kind of not necessarily by games per se, but they're not the like in crazy and competitive environments. No, I'm not, you were at the game. You saw kind of, it was getting spicy. It was really fun, but it wasn't like the level of a, of a full Gamble pavilion. It wasn't, you're looking at like a Villanova matchup. So they got the job done. So I think this week, maybe 17, 18, 19, and then depending upon what happens this upcoming week, I think they go higher. Yeah, I was at the game. My voice is a little raspy <laughs> as a result. Um, there's a good contingent of UConn fans. It was pretty fun. Yeah, um, yeah it was a good time. I was kind of couldn't believe how many UConn fans were there and just how intense the DePaul fans were. It was really the press seating for this game was like right on the court near the UConn bench and right in front of the student section. So it was a very fun time. Yeah, totally. Uh, But you you made a good point. The schedule does turn pretty severely. You got Villanova on Saturday, and then after that, Marquette comes to town, and then Seton Hall, Xavier, all those teams. So with that, who do you think is the biggest threat to UConn in the Big East this year and why? Now, the Huskies sit in third place in the conference standings. Um, They're playing at a high level, very consistent right now. But obviously, there's still a lot of teams in the Big East that they're going to have to contend for a Big East regular season title with. I don't know. I mean, there's just so many like good teams. I mean, we're talking about a seven bid league at the present moment, assuming everyone kind of keeps up and, and things stay the way they are. I mean, obviously it's subject to change, but this is a very competitive league. And as we've seen, like UConn has gone to, um, to the wire in so many recent games and they've kind of gutted out. But again, bottom half of the league. 
So what happens when they start playing these tougher teams is going to be really fun and, and kind of telling about this team. But I do think they got kind of fortunate with, um, you know, you had the Adama Sinogo injury, the Tyrese Martin stuff. So they kind of were unhealthy for some tougher competition, but then were able to kind of kind of find themselves and, and get things rolling when it was most needed. So now that they've kind of figured all of that stuff out, coming into this half should be pretty beneficial. In terms of like who will be the most difficult, I mean, you've got to look at Villanova as always like the top of the top. And I think you look even back to, to 2019 when Dan Hurley famously said, oh, it's coming. I think there's kind of Villanova is that standard in the Big East that everyone kind of looks at itself to and has just carried this league for so long. So I think that will be, I'm just interested to see based on how much progress UConn has made over the two seasons, kind of a benchmark of what that game is going to look like. And even that 2019 game was closer than it had been the, the previous matchup. So to me, that's the one I'm most looking forward to. Yeah, I mean, they set such a high standard, and it's it was interesting that UConn got to play them at a conference when we were in the Big East, because at those matchups, there wasn't even close at all. I mean, they had the first half. It was kind of close. I remember watching it like when I was in high school. That's how long ago it feels. But they, um, it, it, it's a real measuring stick. I mean, Jay Wright is – most successful coach in the big East. So like, there's a, there's a reason for all this and it should be super interesting. But before we jump ahead to Nova, I want to get your thoughts on Creighton because as, as we know, last year they had our number, they had UConn's number. They beat them three times, including in the big East tournament. So what do you think, what's the focal point to stopping Creighton and getting kind of revenge? I mean, players left, so it's not fully revenge, but avenging those losses last year and coming out on top. I think just thinking back to that Creighton game, the first one where Book Knight scored a near uh, that, that 40 point game, just the balance scoring that UConn has has been able to pull off this season and just being able to do that, I think is, is going to be critical. And you didn't see that in the, uh, the first half of the fall game. So I think coming out strong with balance scoring will be a big telltale sign for, for the Huskies against Creighton and just kind of being able to pull that one out. And it's a home game too. So that'll be nice to get back to, to get back to Excel center, I think. Um, and then just keep playing. Sorry. I, there's always so many games and never know which one you're going to be at until the day of. So it's exciting though for fans and, and to be able to have that. And with the students back in school, who's going to show up to, to that game. Jacob, a little scouting report on Creighton. So Charlotte talked about bounce scoring and they kind of, they kind of, uh, they kind of write the book on it because they have four guys in double figures. They have Alex O'Connell known by many people as AOC uh, is averaging 12.8 a game. Uh, and then Ryan Hawkins, 12.6 and seven boards. And their big man who I didn't realize he was averaging three blocks a game, Ryan uh, Kalkbrenner, 12, seven and three blocks. So we have shot blockers. They have a shot blocker. So that's interesting to know. And then the guy I've been looking at since the beginning of the season Ryan Nemhar, he's a, he's a freshman. Remember his brother played uh, at Florida and then Gonzaga. Last game against Xavier when they ended up blowing a big lead, but regardless, he had 23. So it's going to be all hands on deck for UConn on the defensive end also because they have different guys that can beat you. I mean, we saw that with Seton Hall and Kadari Richmond hasn't done anything since. And there might be a guy on Crane that I didn't mention, one of the not four guys that does that on Tuesday. So – Bound scoring, it's right up Creighton's alley. So I'm not I'm not surprised that they're they are where they are and that they're in the middle of the Big East despite losing all their top guys. Yeah, so Creighton's four and four in the conference, as you just said, um, twelve and seven overall. But they they've lost two straight, including getting sort of walloped by Butler, which was a little surprising considering how Creighton was playing. Now Ryan Cockbrenner is sort of this big, tall, awkward looking guy, and actually. When I was at Big East Media Day in October, we were walking, you know, from Madison Square Garden area up towards Times Square wearing Yukon stuff. We saw this super tall guy walking towards us with those classic, like kind of nerdy glasses. And he walks by us and he goes, go Huskies. And then I turn around, I'm like, huh, that was Ryan Cockbrenner. So Ryan Cockbrenner is a noted Yukon Huskies fan. Um, hopefully he shows that in the game against the Huskies. Um, but anyways, last question. Uh, heading into February and looking at the season so far, if you had to make one takeaway, sort of what is the most impressive thing you've seen this year from UConn? I don't know. There's, there's quite a bit. 
I think the fight that this team has shown has exhibited a lot of growth in years past and their ability to kind of get out of overtime games. Um, I was just looking at this recently. I think they've played five overtime games and I think they're two and three in overtime or three and two. I need to look that back. I think it's three and two. Um, and maybe we need to fact check that before. <laughs> um, but that's been one thing that's impressed me. It's also the balance scoring. Um, I know we just talked about that with relation to Creighton, but I think that's been the biggest key for this team is that they do have a guy, maybe not necessarily like that go-to a la James Booknight last season. Whereas, I mean, Cole is kind of becoming that guy and he is that dude um, who knows how to take over. But because there's so many people that can score, it doesn't feel like it's going to get stagnant. Whereas sometimes when, when Book Knight came out of the game last season, you never knew who was going to be able to hit that shot or hit that blow, um, hit that score. So to me, it's just there's so much better offensive flow. Not that that's the case every game, but because there's not that one go-to score, things just look a lot smoother, a lot cleaner. And they kind of, they all really trust each other. There's that depth. There's, it's just very pretty to watch when it's flowing and, and it's fun to see that happening. Yeah, I think that's piece. a huge asset come, come February and just the depth of the team and in theory, knock on wood, that everyone's healthy, that it is going to be clutch for this the squad. Cause you know, I mean, like Dan has so many options to go to on the bench and you just kind of, he's playing, I think an eight man or a nine man regular rotation. Um, so that's really big. I have to piggyback off that real quick. When they, when they play at a high level, especially in the offensive end, it's really beautiful to watch. And I think a lot of the times it's led by Andre Jackson passing. Um, there were a couple of plays yesterday or excuse me on Saturday against DePaul that he just sort of was running the offense and it looked in control and it didn't look like ISO ball and it didn't look stagnant. And it didn't look like they were just running through the motions of running plays. And then there was one other play, I think it was Tyrese Martin, a little backdoor cut to Adama Sinogo who flushed it. And that was sort of the play that said, all right, UConn struggled. They didn't play their best ball against DePaul, but they got this. They're going to win. They're going to win on the road and they're going to come home and be six and two in Big East play. That's a sign of this team. They can overcome adversity, overcome not playing their best because they do have a lot of depth and a lot of players who can step up at any given time and not just rely on that alpha score. Mm -hmm. So Charlotte, thanks for joining us on this episode of Run It Back. UConn will host Creighton at the XL Center Tuesday night, 6.30 FS1. Be interesting to see what the crowd is like. I know students are back, but again, as Jacob and I have talked about XL Center, 35 minute drive from campus. So not the most ideal. No, and will you be there? I will be there. I'll actually, I'll actually be covering it. So okay. hopefully I get my voice back. <laughs> Tea and honey. Jacob, will you be able to get there? I'll try. I got class. I don't think UConn likes to factor in the whole class aspect of the basketball thing, but I'll either way I'll be watching. So there no go. worries there. Thank you both for having me on. It was fun, fun to talk UConn and especially fun to talk to Paul Chicago because I'm a Chicago area native. So very fun. Okay, so I guess last question, are you, are you a deep dish fan? I know deep dish is kind of a tourist thing, but it has to be asked. I will eat it. I prefer tavern style. That is my tavern style crusade that I will be going on next time with the beat writers because they're all like, everyone's hating on deep dish, which I can understand. It is not a thing I regularly eat. I am all about the tavern style. So I will change lives with that the next trip to Chicago. All right, sounds good. Next year it is. For Jacob Sonic and Charlotte Carroll, I'm Noam Watt. Thanks for tuning in to Run It Back. We'll see you later in the week for a preview of Villanova.